So, uh, to start this evening, we're going to speak about one of the first studies that we have done. Uh, these are my financial disclosure. I'm happy to be part of the development team of Oculus. And this is how it started. So it started some years ago, a very nice group, and we all met together in American Academy. And we decided that we were going to be not only friends, but also a research group. And uh, this led to many papers, and one of them is the one that I'm going to present to you, that awarded the group, not only me, but the group, with the Troutman Prize from American Academy last year. So we're very proud of that. And... <laughs> So I'm going to speak to you a little bit in general about ectasia screening and why do we believe that biomechanics plays an important role. And then I will go through the study and how we use this new biomechanical index in clinical practice. I will not go through in details in uh, any clinical cases because uh, Paolo and Renato will show you that. So it will be more, let's say, technical. So we know that it's a challenge to diagnose ectasia because we want to treat the patient very early and because we have patients that do not develop ectasia even if they have high risk and then we have patients with low risk and then they develop ectasia. So we need to increase the sensitivity and specificity. Cinzia introduced a theory many years ago and it was then uh, confirmed by the studies of Giuliano Scarcelli uh, in which they proved that probably the initiating event of keratoconus is a focal reduction in biomechanical properties. And this will result in thinning as the weaker area strains more than the surrounding stronger areas. So this focal reduction will then generate a vicious circle that will cause greater deformation for the same load and then increase of curvature. So this theory goes into practice that if we have this as a first change, then we can first diagnose keratoconus in a biomechanical stage before we have tomographical, topographical, and then street thumb changes. So obviously we have used the Corvis ST to do this study. Uh, we wanted to create a combined biomechanical index to separate healthy from keratoconus patient and to validate it in a big data set. So the population was quite big, 658 patients from two studies, sorry, from two clinics, particularly from Rio de Janeiro and Milan. Um, they were clear bilateral keratoconus with no previous ocular surgery and all the healthy patients was an a huge amount of uh, work because they were not only completely virgin patients with a bed D of less than 1.6, but Paolo and Renato went through all the patients from the other clinic to be sure that they were actually healthy. You, ma you imagine with their clinical practice the amount of work. Um, all the Corvis were with good quality score and uh, Oculus also helped us because they were not only captured by automatic release, but they evaluated frame by frame that the analysis was properly done. So, we have done logistic regression, that is um, a way of artificial intelligence. You will see uh, and you will hear from Renato an even more sophisticated way to uh, use uh, artificial intelligence for another index. And we've used one data set as a training one and the second one to exclude the overfitting, but that, because that is the main disadvantage of logistic regression. So, this is the CBI. I want you to first know that this beta has nothing to do with another beta value that they will uh, explain you later on. So it just, it could be alpha, sigma, delta, it's just one word because we have combined many things together that you can see here. So it looks very complex, but don't worry. The only thing you need to remember is that the cutoff is 0 0.5. And particularly, and this is important, so you should not worry that much about this yellow part. So most of your patients, so the healthy one that they have kind of stiff cornea, will be around 0 and 0 0.2 of CBI. The diseased patient and the patient that are at risk, they will be much higher. So a lot of doctors, they will ask, what do we do in this kind of patient? There are few of them that they are around that level. Most of them, they are on the two sides. So these were the parameters that we used. Uh, I will go through a little bit more in details. So we've used a planation velocity one, deformation amplitude ratio, standard deviation of highest concavity, stiffness parameter, and a thickness profile. It's not that much important to go in detail each of these indexes, 
but we have selected them because they were very good to help us to separate between the groups on their own. And then we have also decided to add a thickness profile because it in increased a lot sensitivity and specificity. Um, let me skip this, but I want you to show the results. <coughs> so this is the result of the training data set. If you are not used to see ROC curve, I will also help Renato because then he will not need to explain that. So the, the bigger is the ROC curve, the better is the separation. So the closer you are to the 1.0, the closer you have 100% of sensitivity and specificity. So you can see that it's quite high. But this is the training data set. So you have 98.2 correctly classified, and this is the sensitivity and specificity. But then the main result was the validation data set. So you can see that it was pretty much the same, actually, a little bit better. And another thing that we know is that there has been many external validation from outside of our group, and they showed pretty much the same thing in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So first conclusion. To our knowledge, this was the first time that an index based on biomechanics has been able to produce such an efficient separation. And I would like to add that has been also validated externally from independent uh, users. And the presence of this external validation excludes overfitting and confirms this finding. So it suggested that actually now the CBI is used in everyday clinical practice to aid topography and tomography, not to substitute it for the diagnosis of ectasia. So just to go through one more, remember that you will see the CBI in the commercially available software, and most of your normal patient will be around here, 0 .0, 0 0.0 to 0 0.2. Then you will have some patients around here. You have to expect that these patients, since they are in this very steep part of the curve, if you make two measurements, they might be 0 0.4 one time and 0 0.6 the other time, because it's very steep, the curve. So even if you have a very tiny change just in the repeatability of the exam, the CBI might change a bit. This doesn't mean that the index is not good. It's just you are in a very steep part of the curve. So you know that it is a kind of risky patient, and you should take that into account. If it is more than 0 0.8, it is extremely likely that it's ectasia. So I uh, just wanted to leave you these two QR codes. I think they are also published. Um, this one, I don't think it's printed here, is a second publication that we have done in which we have showed the use of CBI in asymmetric ectasia. So the patient that had one eye that looks normal and the other one that is keratoconus, and we've showed that the CBI was abnormal in both. They are all open access in journal refractive surgery, so you can just type it online as well. Thank you.